Well, good afternoon. Good to see everybody here. And I want to thank Dr. Klein for inviting me to speak to the seminar. It's a good opportunity for me to kind of share with, with some of you graduate students and faculty uh, what we spend our time doing in extension. And I've been fortunate in my career to, to kind of be at the right place at the right time uh, on some new crop interests. I, when I worked at Auburn University, there was a romance or renaissance in the area of Satsuma production. And it was a, a real beneficial experience for me. Similar situation here with olives in Texas. There's a lot of new interest and enthusiasm. And that makes my job interesting or exciting. I, don't, I didn't know anything about olives when I came back to Texas. When I was in Texas previously, I not worked with olives. So it's new to me. And I think newness is stimulating. I think when you have opportunities to, to embrace new crops and look at other uh, research areas, it's, it's, it's a great thing. So I'd encourage you to do that. I have some single coworkers, Tim and Brett and uh, uh, Andrew, and so I thought I'd have this slide for remind them or kind of give them some educational romance. What is romance, and why do I have it in my title? So there's some de there's some definite. This is the history of the, of the usage of the word romance. It's from the Latin word roman uh, romanicus, which means of or in the Roman style. And uh, 1300, it became uh, associated with uh, a, a tale or story, generally involving a knight or a hero, kind of an uh, entertaining tale. And then in the 1660s, this is where it kind of migrated into a love story. There was connotations of uh, using a, the word romance, kind of embraced the idea of a love story. Then uh, 1801, the meaning uh, an adventurous quality was first recorded. And then 1916, uh, the word romance is associated with love affair. Now, I think all of these little definitions can uh, apply to our discussion of, of olives. Uh, a lot of people, are, there's a lot of people who are having a romance with olives in Texas. And in, it's, it's, it's an adventurous experience for them, kind of embraces the Roman uh, culture. We think back to Mediterranean culture. Um, and there's, there's love. People love olive oil. They love cooking with it. They love eating it, using it. So they, all these things are kind of woven into some of the things I'm going to touch on. Of course, we're talking about the, the European olive, Olea uh, uh, Europia. It's in the Oleaceae family, which also has ash, trees, um, privets, Persithia, some other ornamental plants in this family. Of course, the fruit is a droop, it has a hard, inedible stone, and it's used for, historically, it's been used for oil and uh, for lighting, um, use of the oil in cooking, ceremonial uses, bathing, a lot of bathing products, cosmetics derived uh, from olives today. Globally, there's more than 2,000 cultivars. This, this is an old, old fruit crop. It's been cultivated for a long time. So there are lots and lots of cultivars in existence. What's interesting to us in Texas in extension is this plant is very tough, tolerates poor soils, very diverse types of soils. Uh, it is drought tolerant, taking only about 20 acre inches of, uh, of water per year, where we recommend 48 inches for a pecan tree um, on a per acre basis. Uh, salt tolerant, we've got a lot of salt problems with water in Texas, so there's some, there some good horticultural reasons to look at olives. I really like this quote, I'm gonna read this quote. I found this quote as I looked at the history of olive uh, cultivation in, in California, it was written by Nancy Carroll Carter. It says, the olive threads through human experience tangibly as a source of food and useful oil Powerfully as a symbol, whether as Athena's everlasting gift to Greece, carried in the beak of Noah's exploratory dove, or clasped in an eagle's talon on a national seal. Olives are one of the world's oldest cultivated fruits and a hardy survivor of the Columbian Exchange, the transfer of plants from the old world to the new world. And I think that that's, that's really captures kind of the romance, the love, the appreciation that people have and have had throughout history uh, for olives. Now, 
I'll do something a little different. I'm going to tell you the end of this story uh, in the beginning. I'm going to kind of give you the epilogue and why, uh, why I'm here talking about all this. Last year, we received a grant from Texas Department of Agriculture, specialty crop block grant. Uh, our sponsor was the Texas Olive Oil Council, and this was, um, uh, we received an extension, we received 65, a little over $65,000. Texas Tech received almost $50,000, and uh, AgriLife Research had a component at $16,000. Title of this is Investigating Management Practices in Varietal Selection uh, for pr pr Improving Olive Orchard pr Productivity and Quality of Fruit. And my, or our component of this in extension was to, was to develop what we call a coordinated olive variety testing program, meaning that we want to have uh, coordinated same test plots in lots of different locations in Texas in order to compare variety performance across locations and to identify not only superior varieties but ideal locations for growing this crop in the state. So we have a, we've planted this year a network of about 15 different test plots. They're in a lot of different areas of Texas. I'll talk about that a little later. Uh, the uh, the data, care and data collection is kind of a collaborative effort between the specialists, myself, Larry Stein, Jim Thomas, Juan and CISO, as well as extension agents and some growers. Uh, and we've set this up. For peer-reviewed publication, we want scientific outcomes from this project, and we want to help the industry. So it has an applied aspect and an academic uh, outcome, we hope. So we have 10 uh, randomized complete block trials. Uh, these are in 10 different locations. I, didn't, I should have mapped this for you, but in general, they extend from Beaumont to Del Rio, kind of the I-10 corridor. Go up to uh, Wahlberg is up in Williamson County, north of Austin, and then south all the way to Wesico, a research and extension center there, and a number of points in between. We think that should be the focal area uh, for olive production in Texas, and so we're going to use these locations to uh, verify that. We have some non-replicated uh, plots as well. We could manage the data collection on 15 or 17 site, so we have some of these set up strictly for observation. They have three reps of the cultivars that we're evaluating. One of those will be um, uh, here down in the Brazos bottom. We have 12 varieties uh, with six replications, single tree plots, medium density spacing. Uh, we'll, you'll learn a little bit more about high density spacing as we go on. Varieties, uh, these are the varieties. We've purposely collected some varieties that are have some utility for oil production. The interest in Texas is in producing oil rather than table olives. So we're not really looking at table olives, although there's some that can kind of play both sides of that fence. But we've, uh, we've looked uh, to different provenances uh, in order to uh, see if we can learn something about genetics uh, as we go through this project. And we have some, uh, so these are the replicated uh, cultivars, which is 12, then we have some non-replicated border trees, uh, uh, varieties of, that we're less confident in, but maybe uh, needed for pollination purposes. Okay, so that's the epilogue. Now we want to flash back. We want to flash back uh, approximately 2,000 years. Uh, this is uh, the, uh, the olive tree of Vouvet. It's on the island of Crete. I'd love to say this is my picture, but it's not. I haven't been there. I'd like, like to go see that. This tree is estimated to be between two and 3,000 years of age. And this is part of the, 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 the romance of olives. When you see trees of this age and see their, their ability to survive and be productive, people get excited about that, and they connect to the old world uh, when they see this. Um, what is the history of olives? Where do they originate? And I used... Uh, this source here, this origin of cultivated plants, uh, it's about a 19, uh, early 1900s publication. Very interesting discussion of a lot of different domesticated uh, plants in terms of uh, getting at their geographic origin. Origin is important as you move plants to exotic locations such as Texas. And uh, 
what we find, if it, based on this publication, there's certainly uh, the Israel, uh, Judea area could be thought of as an area of, of emergence or, or provenance on olives. Uh, when you look at, uh, we think about the Bible and references to olives there. Uh, the Hebrew word for olive or seat uh, can be traced also to the Tehran area, which is in Iran. So it was a question, uh, did it come from Iran to Israel or, go, or uh, what is the reverse of that possibly? Also, uh, archaeological findings in Egypt would suggest that olives were uh, used in Egypt and grown in Egypt a long, long time ago. Um, the, uh, there is also uh, Theophrastus Frastus, uh, records extensive culture in, uh, of olives in Libya. And the Berber name for olives can be connected to the use of the word for olive in Egypt. So the question is, did olives originate in uh, Libya, move to Egypt, and then uh, the, the Israeli area? Uh, there's some debate about that. Also, uh, the area of Greece can be thought of as a possible area of origin. Uh, of course, a lot of the, uh, the Greek literature, ancient Greek literature, refu uh, refers to olives. And uh, it's known that olives migrated from northern Greece into Sicily, Sardinia. Um, the other connection is with Syria, Turkey, and the question of whether it migrated from Syria and Turkey into Greece and made its uh, route to Libya. So we could go on and on in that circle forever. Fortunately, we have uh, DNA technology today, and they recently done some chloroplast, chloroplast studies and kind of pinpointed Turkey, Syria as the most likely area of uh, origin for olives. But no doubt it was important and moved throughout these, uh, these cultures uh, very liberally and very quickly. So if we look at this area, uh, this Middle Eastern Mediterranean area as area of origin, we come across somewhere between the 30th and 40th parallel uh, into where we are in Texas. Uh, a lot of people like to make that connection. Well, if it's grown on, the, on this latitude, in uh, Greece and Turkey, then maybe we should be able to grow it here uh, in uh, Oklahoma and Nebraska. We know that we can't do that because it's too cold. But uh, certainly if we came west into California, uh, that's where we find uh, a lot of history of olives in the New World. But here's a few things on uh, olives coming into the New World. 1560 was believed to be brought into Peru. Uh, Thomas Jefferson had... Uh, a number of notes recorded on olive trees and kind of promoted olives and the interest in olives uh, in the southern uh, United States, which by 1872, there are some records that suggest it didn't work in the southern United States. Uh, it was brought to Mission San Diego in and in around uh, about 1795. Uh, then we find records uh, for me and Fran uh, Francisco de la Sun uh, reports having successful olive production there at Mission San Diego about 1803. And uh, there were some notes that olives were served at Governor of California's inaugural banquet at about 1816. So we know olives connected in California began to grow and began to be productive. Uh, this is uh, Jay Goodale was a, a writer for the Chicago Tribune. He take, took a trip out to California, traveled the area, and made this note in 1867 that in central and southern California, grapes, peaches, figs, pomegranates, and olives grow with a profusion, profusion which would astound a Yankee. So this was mind-blowing to people from the north, northeast part of the country, to go to California and see the vineyards, the olive groves, the peaches, etc., there. Uh, my, from a personal perspective, my grandmother was born and raised in southern Oklahoma, made a trip much later, 1950s, to California, uh, late 1950s, and she, California, and the fruit production there had a stand impact on her life. Um, 1890, there was a record that there were 90,000 olive trees in California, and by 1960, they were looking at more than 70 varieties. So, um, and here's a picture from this publication I mentioned previously. These are ladies bottling uh, Mission olive oil. And Mission variety of olives is still important. It's in our trial today. It does 
trace back to the old Mission San Diego uh, uh, plantings, uh, and uh, is still an important cultivar in California. We look at California's industry today. There are about 50,000 acres on uh, a little under 2,000 farms, uh, averaging about 25.6 acres per farm. This is USDA Census of Agriculture data. 55% of that is used for oil, 45% used for canning. We contrast that with Spain's industry. There's a shift in California. It was formerly 10% oil and 90% canning. The money today is in oil production rather than the canning of olives, which has been important Cali California for a long time. In contrast, California with the world leader of, of olive oil production or olive production in general, which is Spain, Spain has 5.6 million acres of olives produced by a half a million producers. It's hard for me to, to fathom that. 11 acres per farm, 90% used for oil, and 10% used for canning. California, uh, olive oil production is, is, is distributed throughout the state. Uh, there's six real important counties. I see those uh, pulled out here. And then there's a smattering of production uh, in a number of other counties. Uh, what's interesting with California, as you go north, you still find zone 9B, which is our coastal south part of the state, uh, hardiness zone. The protection from severe winter freezes by the Rockies uh, has allowed olive oil production way up here, almost uh, up in the Napa Valley area. Uh, we probably can skip this. Just some more details on California olives. And again, there's a shift uh, with uh, oil production being the, the dominant use of acreage for olives in the, the state of California. So is there a history of olives in Texas? And if so, what does that look like? Um, here's what we know. We don't know a lot. That uh, uh, at first, I thought about giving this talk. I said, well, I need to look at Gilbert Onderdonk. How many of you know who Gilbert Onderdonk is? Andrew, only one. Gilbert Onderdonk was a man who settled in Texas and uh, was a nurseryman in the south part of the state. And he records a lot of interesting information on a lot of fruit crops. So kind of use him as a historical resource. He, uh, he writes, he traveled into Mexico, and he writes about olives, uh, and he wrote favorably about olives as a crop in Mexico. But he's pretty silent about olives in Texas in his work and in his business otherwise. We don't see much there. Now, I'm going to mention Jim Denny in my next slide, and who was a graduate student here, and he... Uh, looked into this personally himself as a graduate student studying olives here at Texas A&M, and he visited some of the Catholic archives in San Antonio, and they don't indicate that they planted olives as they did in California, which is interesting to, to me. Uh, this is Ernest Mortensen. Mortensen is famous for his grape work, very south part of the state of Texas. Um, in 1938, one of the experiment station bulletins that he authored, he describes olives that he brought from California as uh, performing fairly, uh, really better for uh, as a dooryard crop than as a orchard crop per se. Uh, Dr. Hartman in with University of California, who was a very active olive researcher in the 1950s, 60s, and up into the 80s, uh, wrote uh, this note. You know, when a publication in 1951, there was a 20-year effort in South Texas, and he indicates the 26th uh, parallel uh, latitude, um, uh, which would be Buesico, Brownsville, has failed to, failed to see fruiting in 20 years, failed to see it. I'm going to comment on that. It's an interesting note. Now, we have olives here on Texas A&M campus, and uh, they're over south of the golf course along the parking lot. And if, you, if you, you're over that way, it's over by the, the, uh, the old uh, press building. Uh, you can take a look at these. They look like a, a normal uh, ornamental hedge. And uh, we don't see much fruit on them. These were planted, uh, hundreds of these, and these were manzanillo olive trees. They were planted in 1974. And uh, according to Denny, they produced a crop in 1977, but were damaged by freezes in 1978. 
1981, no doubt 1983, 85, etc. And uh, Denny later would, would note that Manzanillo is the least hardy cultivar in California. So we have a, a, a not so great cultivar here on campus in terms of cold hardiness, but it has lived and frozen back, and you see all these multiple trunks. This thing has been frozen back in the ground repeatedly, but it is is still there. Now, the fact that they hedge it the way they do, I think, maybe precludes some fruiting, at least on occasion. This was uh, Dr. James Denny, or Jim Denny, as many uh, called him. Uh, he's now deceased, but he uh, came here. I don't know the year that he came. His master's uh, thesis was written in 1982. His major professor was Dr. George Ray McKitchen, who is seated right down, <clears throat> right down here. And Jim had a, a, a passion for olives. Dr. McKitchen uh, worked with him on this project, and uh, his thesis is testimony to that work, as well as uh, two refereed journal publications that came out of this. This is a journal, an article published in Journal of American Society of Hort Science, 1983. Dr. McKitchen told me that when Dr. Denny, uh, or Jim at that time, sent this off to, um, for review with, uh, in the journal, he came back with only needing one minor correction. So this was a well-written article and um, um, has been used a lot by other people who have wanted to evaluate uh, climate uh, suitability for olive production. It's another paper, and I'll talk about both these papers a little later. This one is in the uh, Agricultural and Forest Meteorology Journal. I'd love to have the metrics on, citation metrics on these articles because when you do literature review on olive cold hardiness, well, maybe not so much cold hardiness, but chilling and flowering uh, and maybe uh, climate adaptation, these papers are cited and they're cited with, with some regularity. So they're important. And Dr. Denny's work, Dr. McKitchen's work is important to this discussion. So I'm going to leave that. I'm going to come back to that a little bit later. Now I want to fast forward from Denny's time here, which finished somewhere in the mid, early mid-80s, there's kind of a, a quiet period for about 10, 15 years in terms of olive interest, and then it picks back up. So I want to pick that up. We see in the uh, latter 1990s some new plantings that were, that are dotted around uh, the state of Texas. This is the Andersons uh, over at Dilly, Texas, established in 1997. This is uh, Bella Vista Ranch, um, also call themselves the first Texas olive oil company. They also planted about 1998. They're at Wimberley. Uh, this is Sandy Winokur. She is at Elmendorf, which is outside of San Antonio. She also planted about 1998. So we've seen kind of a, a renewed spark of interest in olive planting during that time period. This is uh, Texas Olive Ranch was established by a man named Jim Henry. Jim had some earlier plantings in the mid-1990s that didn't work out, and he planted this effort uh, in uh, Carrizo Springs in uh, 2005. You see here, and what you've seen with, um, at least in the Anderson's planting, is you see fairly close spacing in these plantings. So this is what we call super high density production of olives. This is, uh, of course, former uh, Commissioner of Agriculture, Agriculture, Todd Staples. This is Mr. Henry, his wife, Karen, a couple of their partners. Uh, Jim and his wife established the Texas Olive Oil Council. Uh, there was no Olive Growers Association prior to that in the state of Texas. Uh, they started that. They began to uh, kind of uh, work uh, with uh, the commissioner's office in order to get some attention brought to olives. And uh, as a new crop in Texas, uh, they were active in the specialty crop block grant. And again, I mentioned this is who we got our grant through. Uh, and over a five-year period, uh, uh, Dr. Henry uh, and Jim were successful in getting uh, over half a million dollars in grant money through this program. Now, um, we just unfortunately came into this in the, um, the last year of it. Uh, Texas Tech received uh, some of this money. Some of the money went to USDA work down in Wesico, which I'll talk about. 
because there's a, kind of an interesting historical period here where growers, you know, enthusiasts of olives, people like the Henrys and others, uh, uh, wanted attention, needed attention. They're trying to get, they're trying to establish a new industry. Um, the commissioner's attention, funding, grants, all those kind of things were important to them. And, uh, and they found that um, some of the uh, information that they, they got from Texas A&M maybe didn't sit right on target with the message they wanted to get out. And you'll see here, this is a far Texas Farm Bureau article it says, uh, some say it couldn't be done, others prove them wrong, trial and error, boomer bust. That's olive ranching in the Lone Star State. And here's a statement by Mr. Henry, and it says, the experts base their conclusions on nothing more than opinion, says Jim Henry, founding director of Texas Olive Council. And he's referring to Texas A&M in this. And he says, they had no research or scientific data based on specific trees in test orchards. Well. Uh, was definitely not opinion, and, and I mentioned Jim Denny because Jim Denny worked in olives, worked with Dr. McKitchell, and they, um, when they gave opinion, it was from an, uh, uh, an informed perspective. Nevertheless, there's been a period of time where it was convenient for Texas A&M to be out of the picture, not have specialists working on olives, so that growers could deem themselves the specialists on olive production in the state, and I'll show you why that, that happened. And let me mention... There were some. There have been some some useful things. These are some uh, um, some of the Texas Tech outcomes. There's three graduate students uh, that finished there, and they have a publication on mulch and pre-emergent herbicides. Um, but otherwise, uh, there was a lack of trees in the state. The Olive Oil Council deemed there was a lack of expertise in the state, and they began to try to fill this void themselves. And they did that by looking to California, which was years and years, decades ahead uh, of, of anything that we might try to do in Texas on producing olives for oil production. And what Texas recommended, I mean, what California was doing or recommending was a super high density approach uh, where they plant trees five feet, five to six feet apart, 13 to 15 feet between rows, and you have 600 or more trees per acre. Well, to support that, you need a lot of trees. So you need nurseries that are able to produce trees and lots of them. Um, this, this method uh, certainly results in uh, some yields in the third year. You can produce anywhere from 1 to uh, uh, 1.6 tons per acre. And then you're producing 4 to 5 tons per acre. It's typical of, of high-density high fruit production. It's early and it's high volumes. There's also high, uh, high levels of management that have to go with that. But we've been to California. This is what you'll see. Uh, large ranches, they call them. I don't know why they call olive orchards ranches, but they call them olive ranches. And uh, they're mechanically uh, harvested with uh, over-the-road grape harvesters like you see here. These are $200,000 uh, machines. So you've got to have a lot of production to pay for the machine in order to make this system work. So, um, and then we have some, there's, there's favorable dollars uh, on this system if you, if you value what they tell you in California. There are some, I won't spend a lot of time on this slide, but these are some production costs and some revenue. Uh, this is uh, annual production costs after, at year three. And we get into ultimately some revenue. And yes, uh, the fourth year and older, they're netting um, before debt service. Uh, about twelve hundred seventy-five, or uh, about nine hundred sixty dollars per acre. But you got to have a machine of producing plants, and this is Agro Miura. This is a Spanish-based uh, corporation, and they have a large nursery in California. Agro Miura produces a magazine. That magazine tells you how to grow olives. It tells you who's selling their trees, and all the system to make this work. So it's very much an integrated corporate-run olive production system that is, that is uh, very prevalent in California and then made its way into Texas, right or wrong. Major oil varieties in California include uh, Arbequina, um, Arbasana, uh, which is, these two are Spanish varieties, and the Greek variety, uh, Corniki. Um, I've got some olive oil here from California Olive Ranch. 
When you get done, I encourage you to try it, but it's got probably all three of those varieties in it. They generally rely on those three cultivars for most of the oil production in California. Arbequina is an interesting cultivar, olive cultivar for our discussion. This uh, uh, cultivar originated, um, was uh, what we know about it, what's recorded about it, uh, which is a bit scant, is that it uh, probably originated in the Palace, uh, Palestine area and was taken uh, to Spain in the, by the, either the 7th or 8th uh, Duke uh, uh, Medina, uh, Medina C- uh, Celli. And, um, and that's late 1600s, uh, generally it's thought to be. There, that variety uh, rekindled interest in the area of Ar- uh, Arbeca, in the comarca of the uh, uh, Legarigas. And I'm terrible with both Italian and Spanish, so you're going to have to overlook that. The variety was originally called Arba- Arbequino, and then uh, over time it's kind of evolved into Arbequina with uh, the, the spelling with a, with a Q. It's a very small fruited variety, very small olives, but it's high yielding, it's precocious, which is important to high density systems. You need them to start bearing early in their life, and it's high yielding. Cell fertile does not need cross pollination, uh, and it is very cold hardy. Now, let me expound on that. What do we know about cold hardiness? Because that's very, very important as we uh, talk about olive production in Texas. And what, what very few um, empirical studies on cold hardiness, this is one, I believe this one is in uh, uh, Spain, but uh, this is some laboratory studies looking at leaves and shoots. And uh, Arbequina on leaves showed a uh, critical temperature at about uh, a little under 11 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and that that's kind of follows what we know practically about Arbequina is that it takes down in the range of 10 degrees when everything is, uh, is, goes well and it has um, been fully acclimated. Pequal, another Spanish variety, uh, in this particular study showed it to be even a little more cold hardy. And Arbequina and Pequal, we do use Pequal here in Texas as they do in California and other areas as well. Um, this is uh, a little bit of a, this is, I, I snipped this out of a YouTube video, promotional video. This is some of the Olive Oil Council people. This is Todd Staples again. And um, this is uh, Josh Swafford. Josh is an AM grad, and uh, he got interested in planting olives in Williamson County, north of Georgetown. This is his orchard in the background. They put in a milling, uh, milling plant. This is his grandfather. I uh, don't remember, I think they have 40 acres of olives at this location. This is 2011, the trees are about two years old. And I, want, I didn't wanna take time to show you this little promotional thing. It's really promoting olives and, uh, for Texas. And then this is the same orchard in 2014, after 18 degrees Fahrenheit, froze all the trees. And most of them were cut back to the ground. So 18 degrees, much higher than laboratory studies on Arbequina. But our challenge and our problem in Texas is dynamics in late winter, early spring climate. We go from cold to hot and cold to hot, deacclimating the plants and then making them more susceptible to events like this one. So we have these potential outcomes. We try to go all, grow olives too far north. This is uh, Wortham up near Corsicana, 2011. I had an opportunity to visit this uh, real nice older Greek lady. She had a very romantic uh, planting of olives. She was, had grown up with olives as a child, and she was convinced that Wortham was a great place to grow olives. Now, these all froze. Uh, some of them uh, rebounded, some of them not. And that's the history of olives in, in climates like that, where they're exposed to these uh, occasional severe freezes. And I should point out the same area in 1989 went to one degrees below zero Fahrenheit, which would certainly be uh, pretty tough on them. So this current romance of olives, if you will, is kind of distributed like this. This is olive oil council information of a lot of different orchards, ranches that have been planted uh, this area of the state. Uh, how does that work out in terms of metrics? If we look at our USDA census of agriculture in 2002, they had no data on olives. There were probably not many that were producing at that time. 
2007, uh, the acreage is not reported, but there were 38 people that participated in the census that reported having an olive orchard. And in 2012, that increased to 87, and the acreage reported at that time was 760 acres. Um, these are the counties that did report, and there were 26 other counties that had undisclosed acreage in that census of agriculture. So we see some diversity here in um, the location of these. This is Olive Oil Council information, and they suggest, because they're in the business of selling trees, that tree numbers uh, look something like this. From 92 to 2013, they estimate there were 600,000 olive trees that were planted. Uh, in 2014, they estimate another 600,000 trees would have been planted. Uh, all, and these are the different sub areas where those were, were headed to. Um, that all adds up. If you do some extrapolation on numbers, all of this would add up to be about 3,200 acres of olives in the state of Texas at present. And I think from uh, my travels and our interaction with growers that uh, this is probably a reasonable, reasonably good number. Now, um, with this current, where we are today, as of 2014, uh, myself, I think through Dr. St Larry Stein's leadership, we had a connection, we, we developed a connection and a collaborative working relationship with Texas Olive, Oil, Texas Olive Oil Council. Olive industry was in trouble. And um, not to say anything bad about Texas Tech University, but their location in Lubbock was not helping the industry in the south part of the state very much. They needed people who could help with basic orchard production. And this is where uh, I and uh, Dr. Stein and Jim Thomas uh, are able to, able to help. So we sat down, kind of uh, uh, dusted off a past history and forged uh, a working relationship. We went to California and got ourselves up to speed on production practices there. We've, we've also been uh, working with growers on an individual basis uh, through this process. Uh, what we find with this new industry is very little basic horticultural information on how to grow olive trees. Inability to control weeds, uh, inability to control pests, fertility mismanagement, irrigation mismanagement, and a lot of orchards that are not, have not produced any olives. But within this are some interesting horticultural challenges. This is uh, Trapeche Ranch. This is in Hebronville, which is um, east of Laredo. So it's pretty far south in the state. This is 400 acres of olives in the fifth year, and they have never seen a flower on an olive tree yet in five years. They're about to abandon it because of the loss of, of income through this process. Now, as what we did, what I did was try to survey growers, try to get at certain problems. What is the status of the industry? So we sent out a survey. We didn't have great response. We asked this question, have you experienced, do you agree or disagree that you've had lack of or absence of flowering in some years? Well, I didn't have a lot of people participate in this, but I do have people agreeing with this statement. They're strongly agreeing that they have a lack of or absence of flowering in some years. So the closer this value is to two, puts this number in the category of either agreeing somewhat or strongly. We have a number of people that are uncertain about how to answer that question. Another question we asked was light cropping, seldom or never producing a big crop. And we have people agreeing with that. If we're gonna be in the business of growing olives, we gotta have fruit and we gotta have large crops of fruit if we're gonna, if we're gonna be in the, the super high density game and afford a mechanical harvester. So, we began to ask, and we had a number of growers tell us that they're not getting fruit, they're not seeing flowers, in some cases, not setting flowers. So as I looked into flowering and olives, it's very, very complex. And uh, I'm gonna spend a few slides on this. It's a wind-pollinated plant. Uh, you have these panicles of flowers with varying numbers of flowers on these panicles. Uh, you can have either male flowers or perfect flowers on any tree. There'll be a different uh, preponderance of one or the other based on variety and based on uh, climate and temperature. Uh, there, 
Flowers are predominantly uh, produced on one-year-old growth, you know, really fruit on older growth, uh, and they're very propo- uh, prone to alternate bearing. This is the cycle of having a large crop of olives, followed by the next year you have very few. I even ran across a, an, an author who said that olives were the most alternate bearing crop in the world. And that's maybe good news for us that work on pecans because we think of pecans as being one of the worst alternate bearing crops in the world. Uh, the flowers may be self-incompatible and they may be cross-incompatible uh, depending on the variety and then depending on climate. This is a challenge. We have varieties that need particular cross-pollination, but in some years they switch that up and they have problems. But that contributes to some challenges with pollination. On top of that, flowers are frost sensitive at or near 32 degrees. That's a challenge for us in Texas. Um, and if it gets too hot, there's problems there. And there's no that this, this plant does not fruit, does not flower in tropical environments. As we go to Hebronville, Texas, or Wesleyco, Texas, we're approaching tropical type environments uh, that may impact this, this fruit. So I want to talk about chilling and uh, and heating, I want to revisit uh, uh, Dr. Denny and Dr. McKitchen's work because I think it's very, very important to me, to the future of this industry, uh, where do olives need to be planted and will they produce a crop? So here is Denny's, Denny's thesis, which I have and I've read. It's very good. These are some of his foundational citations. You always start with trying to extract as much as you can out of the literature, and he did a good job of doing that. And these are some of the foundational things that he banked his work on. The floral initiation occurs eight weeks prior to bloom, to full bloom in olives. In Texas, that's mid-March to mid-April. So induction or initiation is gonna happen two months prior to that. So we're talking about February through March as time periods to be concerned about temperature and other factors in olives. Uh, in some studies where they held temperature constant at 45 degrees, they produced few flowers. And when they went up to 61 degrees, they produced few flowers. So there were controlled studies where they put them at constant temperatures and didn't get good response, meaning that there's a cycling effect that has to happen on this tree to get good flowering. However, there is a study where they had uh, constant 12 and a half degrees at 55 degrees yielded abundant flowering, and this was deemed, not by Denny, but the authors that found this, the compensation point for vernalization. Vernalization refers to exposing plants to constant cold to initiate the flowering process. So the 12.5 degrees C or 55 degrees Fahrenheit was the area where it's not too cold and not too hot, and you had kind of the differentiation as well as some of the growth and development processes to make it all fall in place. The study that showed that a, a diurnal sine wave fluctuation of from 2 to 15 degrees C yielded uh, abundant flowering. So again, the kind of cycling from cold and hot being important rather than just static hot or static uh, cold. Uh, some other uh, temperatures. So they established, this is Hartman and Opitz in California. They established at 2 to 4 degrees C at night and 15.5 to 19 degrees C during the day. Uh, was an optimal uh, temperature regime for getting consistent flowering in uh, olives. There's also notations that extremely high temperatures, 100 degrees Fahrenheit before and or during bloom, uh, can also be deleterious. So again, we're dealing with a complex set of temperature requirements as well as some of the flowering components that make this, this crop very challenging. So here's Denny's work. He developed a data analysis and they went to elaborate efforts to get um, weather data from Italy, Spain, Mexico, and Greece. Compared that to Wesleyco, Texas, five sites in California they used from seven to 30 years of climate data. And he approached that data from some different perspectives. He monitored the total days of chilling from October to May and, uh, and used that as a comparative uh, uh, way to, uh, to look at that data. He then refined that with and defined maximum and minimum temperatures uh, and then looked at all that data and all those sites. He then further 
went back to the literature and used this optimum, this compensation point type temperature and applied that to all these different locations. So he took the data, extracted different, he queried the data with different uh, uh, re uh, requirements and then uh, 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 compared these locations. And what he found was uh, when he looked at chilling and he looked at refining the chilling or optimal temperature, what he found was the factor that was the most helpful in terms of unifying some of these different growing regions, and he had Greece, and he had Spain, and he had Italy. These are areas of successful olive production. What unified them, where the lowest coefficient of variation was, was with this con the number of days that really got at that, not too hot, not too cold, what they call the compensation point for vernalization. So he then uh, uh, ver uh, applied this model to some locations in um, some various locations to be predictive about suitability for, for, for growing olives. He used this parameter, 55 to 70 degree days, 32 to 55 degree nights, October to May. He also looked at the potential for heat damage or spring freeze damage and developed uh, an index. So how do they compare? So here's Greece, here's Israel, here's Spain. These are areas of successful olive production. And we see that these compensation days range from 90 to 180, and fairly low damage in, uh, index, 0.0, .0 being absolutely no risk for uh, either heat or spring freeze damage. Here's Mexico, much fewer of those compensation days. Here's Wesico, Texas, much fewer of those compensation days. And uh, the South Texas locations tended to separate themselves from these areas of historical optimal olive production by having very few of these, what they're calling compensation days where the temperature range falls into that compensation temperature window. You do find areas like Fredericksburg or Austin that do mimic that. They also have a little bit, some of those locations may have a different damage index. So of these locations, Fredericksburg would look favorable, although it has a much higher damage index for uh, growing olives. They used, this map has, was used from, from Denny's work to define three areas of olive production in the state. Uh, the, the lower zone, zone one, to be the area for ornamental only. Zone two would be an area where the, where the olive tree would fruit or be useful as an ornamental. And then above this, this, uh, this line here, uh, that it would not be recommended for survival uh, reasons in cold weather. Now, Texas Olive Oil Council funded some work late, much, much later by Dr. Nasser Malik with USDA in Westlaco. And I'll mention some of his work. He had some differences in his, in his findings uh, in terms of chilling and heating. And I think some of what he has is useful for this discussion. So I'm just going to kind of briefly run through these. He worked with Arbikina specifically. I think maybe one of his papers he incorporates... Uh, Arbasana, Arbikina had not really been looked at in the U.S. in previous studies by Hartman in California on chilling. It certainly was not available to Denny and McKitchen uh, when they were working and looking at olives. It was introduced to the U.S. Uh, after that. And Arbikina, uh, according to Malik, flowered outside the parameters that, that, that Denny set. Fewer days exposure to the compensation point temperatures and Arbikina still flowered and set fruit. And they did this work down in, in Wesico. And uh, they did a series of control studies uh, with plants, and they found that uh, 50 to 88% of trees flower and set fruit with mild uh, temperature, 62, uh, in the range of 62 to 55 degrees for 110 days, January to March. Uh, they bear more flowers when cooling methods limit the number of days that are above 21C, and this is interesting, 70 degrees to fewer than 60. And I think Malik found something useful here in that high temperatures, uh, even what we would consider not seriously high temperatures, 70 degree Fahrenheit is a relatively moderate late winter, early spring temperature. We, we experience that quite frequently. But he found that six days of that um, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll come to that point. 
single ex exposure of six consecutive days at 79 degrees in the day and 61 at night, uh, resulting in 83, greater than 83% inhibition of flowering. One of his studies, he showed that a, a, a flower production is optimized by daytime temperatures about 60s, nighttime temperatures in the range of 40s. And that when you got too low or too cold, there was some inhibition as well. There's a little bit of disagreement here and there, but there are, there's also some harmony between these studies. When you take them and look at them in their totality, and uh, one of Malik's statements was that Galveston would be a superior area for growing olives compared to Wessico. That's no different than what Denny uh, uh, just, uh, un pointed to in, in his work. Uh, so both of these research and efforts in Texas point to both excessively warm winter and spring uh, being deleterious to flowering, whether that's effect, whether that's coming at it from the chilling, vernalization component, whether that's coming from the high temperature interruption, you could you could look at that in totality and say, and if it's too warm, it's a problem for fruiting uh, olives in Texas. Olives are a Mediterranean climate crop; moderate uh, temperatures uh, are are part of that, and part of what we believe is is necessary for fruiting olives in Texas. What we're attempting to do, coming back to the epilogue, is we want to go back to these strategic locations, put different varieties in place. Malik, if Malik has a deficiency, it's not looking at a diverse group of varieties. He's really focused on Arbequina, which may have a unique set of uh, requirements for flowering. And uh, we want to verify uh, locations for superior production and verify superior varieties. Now. I'm going to finish up pretty quickly, but th there's more romance here. There's more to olives than just the temperature thing, which is of interest to me. Uh, we also, as we work with growers, found that a lot of growers complain about trees just dying. They attribute a lot of it to just poor management, establishment. They believe that trees should die in the early life of an orchard. But the numbers of trees, as we begin to, to kick our boots around in these orchards, was, was pretty alarming and very characteristic of a, an old, old historical orchard problem in Texas, which is cotton root rot, which Lauren uh, mentioned I worked on as a, as a graduate student here uh, previously. In our survey, we did find growers that had also lost trees to what they, the reasons they didn't know, um, and, soil related, and possibly soil-related soil problems. As we then began to work with growers and growers submitted, we had growers that didn't even know there was a plant disease clinic here in the state of Texas that would identify a problem with a sick or diseased plant. And so the plant clinic then begins to start receiving samples of dead and dying plants. And what we see, and you see it here, is lots of plants uh, with cotton root rot. We had growers telling us that verticillium was a problem because they had seen verticillium listed as a potential disease problem on olives in California and other parts of the world. Other parts of the world largely don't deal with cotton root rot. It's unique to Texas, New Mexico, Mexico, maybe a little bit in Arizona. But it is a devastating problem for olives, and it has been devastating in some new orchards. Uh, all these missing trees you see here are due to cotton root rot. And we're not sure today whether, cotton, whether olives are as susceptible of, of apples. If they are, this industry will not last because apples have not succeeded in the hill country or south Texas due to cotton root rot. Um, so we're not sure on that yet. We're also looking at flutriophol, which is a chemical control. There are other potential problems that we're seeing emerge, things like olive knot, which when I first made this slide a year ago, we did not have, and I believe they found it in 2015. This is a, a, a bacterial canker on, uh, on olive trees that can be very, very uh, problematic. Uh, Dr. Stein and I discovered black scale insects in Goliad in 2014. Uh, this is Phytophthora root rot, does not show up well in this slide, but lots of dead trees. In heavy clay soils, uh, olive trees do not do well in that situation as well. I'll wrap up quickly by talking just a little bit about the challenges and future of olive growing in Texas. There are problems and challenges with harvesting. Um, this is uh, the, the Sandy Oaks harvest uh, in 2014, kind of the tail end of it. You see olive fruit laid out here on tarps. 
they hand harvest the olives in many of these orchards in Texas because they can't afford mechanical harvester, nor do they have a, a trees that are trained to allow harvester to ride over them. If you look at olive harvesting, to harvest 10 gallons of oil from a medium-sized variety uh, with a medium yield rate of about 70 pounds per tree would take you about 80,500 individual olives to press 10 gallons of oil. I don't know the last time you picked 80,500 of something, but that takes a lot of time. And so hand harvesting of olives is a challenge. And they do this um, with, uh, uh, do it by hand. There are some electric rakes or vibrating rakes that will kind of rake the olives out of the tree onto tarps. Or they'll hand pick them into uh, baskets, dump them into bins. So you've got to have labor and you've got to have time to do that. And as olives mature, they are uh, sensitive to temperature. If they sit after the harvesting process, you'll lose quality, and you'll have some uh, chemical changes that are, uh, that are a problem. How, how many olives do you have to have? The literature is all over the board on that, anywhere from 40 pounds to get one gallon of oil up to 170. Uh, we got some notes this year that some growers uh, collected uh, 1,500 pounds of olives, it yielded 7.5 gallons of oil. That's taken 200 pounds of olives to get um, a gallon of oil. That's a, lot of, that's a lot of fruit. That's a lot of effort. A lot of factors go into it. The variety, the yield of oil is different by variety. The age of the fruit is important. The, the environmental conditions are important. So olive harvesting and milling uh, can be a real challenge. Very expensive process to set up a mill. We have eight to 10 mills that have been set up in Texas, including one that has been set up on wheels. It's a company that has brought in and purchased a mobile mill. They haul it and drive it on a semi tractor trailer and they'll bring it to your orchard and, uh, and mill your fruit. Uh, can Texas compete beyond having kind of a boutique or specialty crop product? If we produce it on the order of California, that we're gonna need to be able to sell it on the grocery store shelves. And can we do that profitably? We don't know um, the answer to that just yet. The competition, you go to, uh, if, you, if you looked uh, on the grocery store shelves, there's lots of olive oil for sale. It comes from Italy, it comes from Spain, it comes from Tunisia, it comes from Greece, it comes from Chile. And um, there is not a lot of regulation on labeling of olive oil, and a lot of U.S. growers would like to have some more enforcement on that. Um, we, we don't eat a lot of olive oil, consume a lot of olive oil in the U.S. We only produce about 3.5% of the world's production. That's largely California. We're not contributing much to that yet in Texas. Uh, but we consume a fair amount at a rate of about 293,000 metric tons per year in Spain, which, which consumes uh, far more than that, they consume about 15 liters per person per year. I don't know how many of you eat or consume that much olive oil. I know I don't yet, but I've been, as I've gotten kind of addicted and given, when, when people give me free olive oil, it kind of has a carryover effect to my dietary habits, and I'm, my, my consumption is increasing. In the U.S., we only consume about a liter per person per year. So there's a lot of room for olive production and in, in oil production in, in the U.S. to be consumed here at home. And there's potentially a market for it. But there's got to be a level playing field in terms of cost of production. And some of what you get off the grocery store shelves is either older. And if you look, most of the olive oil that you buy does not have a date on the bottle. It'll have a use, best used by date, which the 2014 crop will put 2017 on the use-by date. That's three years in the bottle. And I'll tell you, if you ever have an opportunity to eat it fresh, and unfortunately this is not, it's a different experience. And with more people getting that experience, I think the demand for fresh, grown in the U.S. olive oil probably has a room to increase. There are standards for extra virgin olive oil. We won't go into that. But this is a bit of an interesting. Maybe we need a celebrity. And uh, Bobby Flay... Perhaps the famous chef and famous New York chef 
is perhaps on his way to hell. This is uh, orchard at Ensenal, Texas, which is not far from Catula, north of Hebronville. This is, uh, you know, I think it's 300 to 400 acre olive, new olive oil planting. The owners have a connection with Bobby Flay. They know him personally, and this is all hearsay and rumor, but Bobby Flay has apparently said he will buy all the Texas olive oil that he can get his hands on. So maybe it takes that. Maybe that'll happen. Maybe Cotton Rerod will wipe that out. I don't know. But uh, Texas growers may need that. So to wrap up, uh, major risk for all is uh, historically and continues to be winter injury to trees, uh, spring frost, knocking out the crop, and uh, these heat waves, as few as six days, uh, uh, research has shown to be a problem. Getting enough cool weather to vernalize these trees and, and induce flowers. And so we need to continue to work at, at identifying the ideal uh, climatic region in the state, which is the goal of our project. The olive industry today in Texas is composed of very diverse orchard size. Um, that's a challenge. We've got orchards that are two acres, and we have orchards that are 200 acres and bigger. That creates challenges for harvesting operations, economy of scale, uh, is going to be a problem for some of these growers. And grower co-ops, mobile meals may be uh, the way that growers uh, of small farms are able to uh, hang in there and get their crop to market. Uh, we still have to op optimize cultivars. We have to optimize uh, tree spacing. A lot of horticulture in front of us to work out on, um, on growing olives in Texas. The oil is very good in um, and the adaptability of the tree uh, to our water challenges and our salt problems, our soil problems, uh, makes this a good uh, crop for us to be researching.